We are certainly very sorry for all those who are ill, but we're very happy that you're able to be here, and we certainly want to keep those who are ill in mind. You know, it's good sometimes, and I'll say this before I actually get into the lesson, just to know that somebody is thinking about you. Now, I know that doesn't take the place of our praying for one another, but it's good to know that brothers and sisters in Christ are mindful of us. If you read through Paul's writings, you'll see, he, you'll see that he mentions several things like that concerning his own concerns for the brethren to whom he wrote. So not only are we to be praying, and I'm sure we are, for those who are ill and for other reasons, but we're thinking about our brethren, and in spirit we're mindful of their situation. Whatsoever things written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. Romans 15, 4. That we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures. Now he's writing part of the New Testament when he writes that. And a lot of other letters that make up the New Testament had not been written at the time that he wrote that. But what does he have in mind when he says that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope? He means the Old Testament Scriptures. Much of the preaching, if not most of it, done in the first century, and I know it was the case when they were preaching to Jews and proselytes, was located in the Old Testament. They would begin there and then show how it led them to Christ and how the law of Moses, as Paul wrote, was a schoolmaster to bring them unto Christ. Galatians 3.24. You can see that in Philip's preaching to the Ethiopian eunuch, where they began with the same scripture, which was in Isaiah 53, and Philip preached unto him Jesus. So the Old Testament, one of the ways the Old Testament is very helpful to us in being faithful to Jesus as Christians in the church, is to look at people that have been selected by inspiration and look at how they live, how God dealt with them, and so forth. And I would like to look at Josephat today, King Josephat of the southern kingdom of Judah. And I want us to keep in mind, as we study a little bit about some things about Jehoshaphat, that there are those people who teach that once you become a Christian, there's no possibility that you'll be lost forevermore in a devil's hell. And it's usually called once saved, always saved. Or the impossibility of apostasy. Yet when you read your Bible, warning after warning after warning after warning is given to those who are on God's side, who love Him, that they must be very careful as they slip off into what's wrong, contrary to the doctrine of Christ. So why warn people of that possibility if there is no possibility? It really doesn't make sense. The writer of the Hebrews epistle, keeping in mind he wrote to Jews who were Christians, and that they were actually thinking about, due to persecution, of giving up the New Testament system and going back under Judaism. And he says to them, in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12, and going through verse 13, Take heed, brethren. So I know he's talking to members of the church, his brethren in the Lord. And he says, you take heed. Well, there's no possibility of apostasy. Take heed about what? Take heed, brethren, lest happily there shall be in any one of you an evil heart of unbelief. Well, if you can't fall from grace, no matter what you think, say, or do, or not do, why is this important? Why should it be included? And notice he says, in falling away from the living God. Falling away from the living God. There are those who try to say, well, you can fall, but you won't fall completely away as to be eternally lost. That was debated hot and heavy in the 19th century, and especially the early part of it, since so many of the denominations were rooted and grounded in pure old Calvinism because that's where that doctrine comes from. 
I remember an account in history where John Smith, known many times as Raccoon John Smith, though he didn't like to be called Raccoon John Smith, was in a debate under a brush arbor, and that was done many times for various occasions in those days. And he was debating the preacher, denominational preacher, on this very subject, the impossibility of apostasy. And he was showing that, yes, you don't have to, but you can fall from grace is to be eternally lost. And this man was trying to say, well, you'll fall a certain distance, but you're not going to fall to be eternally lost. And he decided to be late for one of the sessions at night. And the preacher was up saying, well, he couldn't stand it. He couldn't face the music. He lost the debate, so he's too ashamed to appear. And then about that time, I guess he allowed the denominational preacher to get himself out on a limb. And now it was time to cut it off. He came galloping up on his horse under the brush arbor. And as he got up toward the front where they'd been standing and debating, he grabbed hold of one of the poles that went across, let the horse go out from under him, and everybody was startled. And he looked around at them and hung there for a while and said, if I turn loose of this pole, will I fall and hit the ground? Of course, the emphasis is you don't fall if you fulfill your responsibility. And in that case, if he turned loose of that pole, everybody there knew what was going to happen. Because, you see, Calvinism says you have nothing you can do in order to be saved from your sins or to remain saved. So some of the greatest teaching and preaching that was done in the early part and all through the 19th century for that matter, but in the early part of the restoration of ancient pure primitive New Testament Christianity was dealing with Calvinism and that man is a free moral agent. And he can take that Bible and know the mind of God as he studies it correctly. He can know what God requires of him. He can know that he from the heart has obeyed it. And he can know he is on God's side. And he can know how to continue to be faithful to him. And he can know even when he sins. And he needs to repent. And thus he turns loose and falls to the ground. And makes as big a point in that debate as just about you could with all the words you might muster. As a passing interest, one time he was baptizing folks in a river, and he was baptizing a whole host of members of a Methodist church. And the preacher was standing on the bank very upset. And when he got through baptizing those and had come to be baptized, all of a sudden Smith ran out on the bank and grabbed the preacher and started dragging him toward the water. And the man said, I don't want to be baptized. Why? You can't force me against my will to be baptized. He continued to drag him. When he got down close to the water, man is protesting something vigorously, and all of a sudden he just lets him go. He said, you remember that when you're baptizing these babies? Because they didn't have any choice in the matter. And here he is all the way down the bank saying, I've got a choice, and I choose not to obey. But these people I've been baptizing chose to believe, repent, and be baptized for the remission of sins. It was their choice. Now, I think that is a good example, before we go any further, of saying how that you don't have to have a degree in theology and know Greek and Hebrew before you can teach the first principles of the gospel of Christ to people if you just think about ways to do it. So, take heed, brethren, that as happy there shall be in any one of you an evil heart of unbelief in falling away from the living God. Well, what are we to do then? Well, part of our gathering today as we fellowship in the worship of Almighty God in this first day assembly is to exhort one another. So these are assemblies of worship, but they're assemblies of exhortation. For by the worship, we exhort one another to walk the straight and right way. We give one another courage and comfort. We admonish one another and even rebuke one another. When you think of the songs we sing, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, we're to be teaching one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. So, but exhort one another day by day, so long as it's called today, lest any one of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Again, that passage is Hebrews 3, 12, 13. 
But when you go back to the Galatian brethren, Paul had this to say. In fact, it's good to study the letter to the Galatians and Hebrews together. Paul said, you ran well. Who hindered you that ye should not obey the truth? Now, these are not people outside of Christ. These are people who've heard the gospel, believed it from the heart, obeyed it, and were handed to the church. They're members of the church. So it's obvious that as a member of the church, you still have to be concerned about the truth of God as to how you're to live the Christian life and your responsibilities in the church, Galatians 5, 7. Now that's all introductory to say, what about Josephat? Josephat had a great beginning. But that brightness of his great beginning was eclipsed because he failed later on. And that's the reason he serves as a good example of one who was fully acceptable to God, being what he ought to be, but due to his own choices, bad choices. He ceased to be what he once was. Notice in Second Chronicles chapter 17, and verse 3. And the Lord was with Jehoshaphat because, that means he's going to give us the reason the Lord was with him, because he walked in the first ways of his father David and sought not unto the Balaam, or the Balim. Anytime you see an I am, it's plural. There was a pantheon of gods. When you see Baal, there was a female Baal, <laughs> and so on, although she wouldn't call that. So there was a whole family of gods. And he had abhorred that and was against it. Well, if one chooses to walk with God and remain walking with God and all that that means, then success is guaranteed. The New Testament is full of material that teaches that. In the beginning... As far as Jehoshaphat's concerned, he did not allow the sins of others to become a stumbling block to him. And we learned something here about what a biblical stumbling block is. Whatever a stumbling block is, as the Bible uses it, it causes you to go out and commit sin. Maybe not the same sin, but it causes you to go out and commit sin. He knew that God is the flawless, perfect example. Thus he chose to follow God, which means to follow his will. You can't follow God and not follow his teaching. And then God was with him, of course. That tells us, in a very simple manner, that as we love the truth, incorporate it into our lives, buffet our bodies and bring them in subjection to the truth, we're steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Our actions are not vain or empty in the Lord. God notes them. There may be others who are doing because of wealth or whatever far greater things that get all sorts of people's attention. And they may be good. But God is looking for the person who acts based upon his authority who does things His way. Because that's the only way you can manifest trust or faith in God and His system is to do things His way. We see Him greatly, that is Jehoshaphat, greatly encouraged in Second Chronicles chapter 17 and verse 6. It says of Him, And His heart was lifted up in the ways of the Lord. Furthermore, and furthermore, He took away the high places and the Asherim, out of Judah. He was very opposed to idolatry. It's hard for us, as we've said many times, to realize just what a plague idolatry was to those people and how much it impacted them. But it was. They kept running back to it because they didn't have anything like the people round about them. They didn't have all of this kind of fall to rock. Because all of that appeals to a person's human understanding and desires. Jehoshaphat guarded against his heart becoming consumed with pride when he started his rule. 
He evidently realized what the Bible teaches in Proverbs 16, verse 18. Pride goes before a fall or destruction. And a haughty spirit before a fall. We need to be sure that we don't think, well, here I stand, and I've been standing here for many years, nothing can happen to me. Even the New Testament says, he who thinketh he standeth, take heed. Remember our take heed from Hebrews 3.12? Take heed lest ye fall. There's never a time we shouldn't be vigilant. Now, I'm not talking about being anxious, which anxiety is condemned in the Scriptures, or worrying ourselves. All we have to do is live day by day because sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof and meet whatever Satan throws at us today with a thus saith the Lord. And if we do that every day, it goes on and on. I remember back many, many years ago, a college teacher who, remember the church and a gospel preacher performed <laughs> Joanne and I's wedding. I was talking about going to graduate school, and he said, look, let me tell you how to get through it. He says, don't look at the whole of it, because it'll look just insurmountable and all the stuff you need to accomplish to reach the end. He said, take it course by course, and don't think beyond that. And the next thing you know, you'll have just all of it stacked up and about over. And that works. Well, that's another way of saying, as we live our lives, take your Bible and deal with everything that happens today. Solve it with the Bible, whatever the problems may be. And guess what? Someday, and it all mounts up pretty fast, you'll be looking eternity in the eye. So when the devil can use pride to lift up one's heart, it's lifted from the ways of the Lord. And it'll be turned to the ways of defeat and death because we'll become, in the wrong way, self-sufficient. I don't need anybody. I don't need God. I don't need anything. You think, well, I can't, get, I can't be that way. Well, let's continue to look at Jehoshaphat. Uh, that's in the Bible for you to study, for me to study, and to draw a lesson. God gives no encouragement to one who chooses to live a manner of life that's in opposition to his will. It's only, here's this choice business again from our free will. It's only when we choose God's word to be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our pathway, Psalm 119, 105, that we can expect the blessings that he wants for all of us. These things are conditional. And we need to understand that. That's one of the first things to teach people when you're trying to convert them. And much of what is involved in serving God is conditional. But then we see something happen with Jehoshaphat. In 2 Chronicles 18 and verse 1, Now Jehoshaphat had riches and honor in abundance. And then this happened. And he joined affinity with Ahab. Now you read all of this up to this point about this man and his dedication to God and to the law of Moses, his opposition to false religion of the day. And then you see how God has blessed him with this wealth. And yet, who does he turn to to be good buddies? Well, the northern kingdom and a man like Ahab. I can't figure out why. I just know as a normal human being, he let all this stuff work to say he'd be good buddy with Ahab. Well, there couldn't be any more wicked person on this earth than Ahab. It was our Lord and Savior who said, it's hard for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven, Matthew 19, 23. The reason why is because they attach us to this world. And we hate to leave it. Because there's where our riches are found. There's where our joy is. More often than not, this is especially important for Americans. Satan uses affluence as his tool to hinder man's loyalty to God. 
And Paul would tell Timothy, and it's still true, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, 1 Timothy 6.10. I think I mentioned not long ago about this preacher many years ago. He's dead now. But he was one of these early health and wealth preachers. If you serve God, you're going to get rich. But he would come on the air. This was part of his introduction. Every time his material came on the air, it was nationwide on whatever, Reverend Ike. <laughs> it is not the love of money. That's the root of all evil. It's the absence of money. <laughs> That's the root of all evil. And he would come on every night that way. And that tells you the kind of person he is without going any further that he would just simply change the scriptures. In fact, the Greek says the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And we have our warning there. doesn't mean that financial matters can't be used for good. That's obvious because one of the acts of worship in the first day of the work of assembly is giving him our means, giving as we've been prospered, giving cheerfully. Giving so the church can carry out the work of the Lord. So we're stewards. We're taught of whatever we have materially. Part of that's our money. So God expects us to be attached to it from the standpoint of using it. But here's the way you use it. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. All these things shall be added unto you. So we must control our riches and not allow our riches, great or small, or our desire to have riches, control us. The Bible also reminds us to be not deceived. Evil companionship corrupts good morals. That's the ASB, 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Now again, back to Ahab. Evil companionship corrupts good morals. He sought affinity with him. Ahab to put it mildly, was a well-known enemy of God. Now question, why would a righteous man, as we've been reading about Jehoshaphat earlier, why would he desire to associate with Ahab, a man of that kind of reputation? Listen to this. Ahab did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger that all the kings of Israel that were before him, 1 Kings 16, 33. Now let's seek affinity with a man like that. When the Lord's blessed you because you've loved him and kept his commandments, something happened in the mind of this man. And that's 1 Kings 16, 33. Surely we see a tremendous, vital lesson taught here. When one chooses to form a friendship with a worldly person. We use Ahab here because scriptures did as an example. Guess what's going to happen eventually if you keep that up? You're going to be in fellowship with him in his worldly ways. It happens every time. Now, you find in the Bible teaching us really how far you can go in being associated with worldly people. Paul does that with the Corinthians. He'll say, now I know that you can't escape all adulterers and idolaters and thieves and covetous. I know that. As you circulate in the world, after all, you are wanting to teach a lot of these people the truth so they can repent and obey the gospel. And obviously, 1 Corinthians 6 he says, uh, gives a list of what they had been in the world, and he says, such were some of you. Some had heard the gospel. They changed their lives. But he knew that if you continue to cultivate this kind of friendship and association, and we would say, buddy up with them, it's going to rub off on you. Now, if this is not being taught in this Old Testament passage about Joseph, had, why would it be written here for our learning? Here's what he said in 2 Chronicles 18, 2. And after certain years, he went down to Ahab to Samaria. Now, I don't understand the view of 
history of Israel and what it did and its very quick move into idolatry, why any king who was loyal to God, faithful to him, and righteous would want to go to Samaria. Now, you can be sure that the ungodly Ahab, anybody that fits in the Ahab category, are always ready to have the servants of God come down to their level. Have you noticed that if you get to know people in the world and you keep yourself, as the Bible says you ought to, that as they get to feel a little more familiar with you, they'll begin to try you out as to what you will put up with. At first, they may not use any foul language or totally dirty jokes, but the longer you're around them and they feel a little more comfortable, they'll, they'll start using a little more of those words. They'll start telling jokes, and you'll start seeing them for what they are rather than hiding themselves from you because you are what you are. That's the way the devil operates, and Paul says we're not ignorant of Satan's devices, and I must say at this point, are we? Nehemiah resisted the temptation to visit with Tobiah and Sanballat when they were rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. Notice how different he was from Jehoshaphat. Notice the answer that should be our answer and should have been the answer of Jehoshaphat and his whole attitude toward Ahab. Here's what Nehemiah said. I'm doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease? While I come down, when I leave it, and while I come down to you. And that's exactly see what Tobiah was trying to do, San Ballot, to get him to stop working on that. They were working every way possible to get them not to build the walls of Jerusalem. Nehemiah 6 3. So why should a faithful child of God willingly depart from the straight and narrow way of holiness into the pathways of unrighteousness, the broad way, the wide way, the easy way? Something's happening in that man's heart that would move him that way. It didn't just go from a very strong, faithful Jehoshaphat and the next day, here he is over here. There were things slipping in his life. The Bible doesn't explicitly, just so many words, say that, but I know that's the way we operate. And I know what the Bible says about evil companionship, corrupting good morals. I know what it says about, thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil. Those things all say that it's easier to do wrong when you're around people that love doing wrong. So Christians are even taught not to be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Sometimes you have to read that and say, now, did he say yoked, unequally yoked? Well, if you say he said yoked, I'll just have to back you up and say, no, there's a reason unequally yoked is there rather than yoked. You may have a job that puts you right across from somebody that's not a Christian. Well, you're not unequally yoked unless that association in that job begins to pull you away from the truth. You may be in some sort of a family relationship. It's not an unequal yoking until it is pulling you away from the truth. Yoke puts you together. Paul's made it clear, all togetherness with the world is not evil. Or you must needs go out of the world because the wicked people are all around us. But you don't seek affinity like Jehoshaphat did with Ahab and become good buddies with them. That's the point. Light doesn't mix with darkness. Even though liberals like to say there are all sorts of shades of gray and that kind of thing. No, when it comes to to what's right and wrong, it's not that way. Darkness may need the light, and it does, letting darkness be wicked things. But light can have no fellowship with darkness. Paul made that clear to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 18. We see then Joseph at completely Surrender. No, not surrender to God, but to the unprincipled, ungodly, wicked Ahab. Didn't happen overnight. 
but he moved ever closer in affinity to Ahab. In 2 Chronicles chapter 18, verse 3, And Ahab king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat king of Judah, Wilt thou go with me to Ramoth Gilead? And he answered him, I am as thou art. Now think about that for a minute. You know what the Bible says about Ahab. You know how we read that he did more evil than any of those before him. Now would you as a righteous person say, I am as, as thou art? And my people as thy people. And we will be with thee in war. Again, Second Chronicles 18.3. When will we ever learn that compromise is a killer? The moment Jehoshaphat promised to help Ahab, this, he was worthless to God and an enemy of God, as was Ahab. One doesn't fraternize with the enemy and come out unscathed. As we bring this lesson to a close, I hope you'll think about how this helps us in going back to the Old Testament, look at various characters, and how we can draw lessons. Very simple lessons. Look how powerful this is concerning what you do with your life and who you associate with. Good beginnings are important. You have to begin to be good. But that doesn't guarantee it will end up good. You have to persevere. You have to be steadfast. You have to keep on keeping on. You have to, when you make mistakes, recognize them, repent of them, pick up and go on and never stop. We are interested in a good ending. A good ending. That's essential to making heaven our eternal home. So we need to adopt what the Apostle Paul said. Press on toward the goal under the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. In Christ is to be in His church, the spiritual body of Christ, the kingdom of heaven. Where God has located all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, Ephesians 1.3 where we have the expectation of going to heaven, where we can help others keep that expectation and build it up and encourage one another to spend time in the proper study of the Bible and our prayers and our concern for our brethren that we stay true to the teachings of Christ all through our life. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Revelation 2.10 so if you're not a Christian today, as I said, you have to begin. And becoming a Christian is the place you begin. By believing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, repenting of your sins, confessing your faith in Him, and being baptized for the remission of sins. The Lord adds you to His church. That's the beginning. You're a babe in Christ, a new creature. And now you continue to grow in the knowledge and the grace of Christ as your faithful member of the church until you just grow right on into heaven. These lessons like this are designed to get us from earth to glory. They're not difficult to understand, but they are powerful in what they teach and our being steadfast to the Lord. If as a child of God you sin, we urge you to be humble and repent of those sins and pray God for forgiveness. And if you need either one of those, we invite you to respond to the gospel invitation while we stand and while we sing.